Hi, this is Julie Lerman, author of Programming Entity Framework, with the first in a series of beginning Entity Framework tutorials I've created using Visual Studio 2010. You can find more of these videos at www.pluralsight.com. In this video, I'll show you how to create an entity data model from an existing database. Then we'll take a look at the various parts of the model. The project created in this video will be used as the basis for additional how-to videos using Entity Framework. I'll begin by creating a new project for our entity data model. Now I'm going to place this project in a class library so that it, I'm able to reuse the model from various applications. I'll add a new entity data model from the data templates in Visual Studio, and I'm going to name this AW model. And the first screen in the wizard asks if we want to create this from a database that already exists or start with an empty model. And for this video, we're going to start with a database that pre exists. I'm going to select a database that I've already set up in Visual Studio. This is AdventureWorks Super LT. It's actually a version of AdventureWorks LT that I've stripped down even more. And down on the bottom of the wizard is where you see the entity container name. This is the name of the container which will house all of your entities, and it actually will be an instantiated class that you'll reference frequently when you're programming. So I like to make that a shorter name. So I'm going to make it AW Entities and click Next. Now the wizard's going to read the database and show me all the tables, views, stored procedures, and within stored procedures I'll also see user-defined functions from the database. And I can select what I want to be in the model. For now, I'm going to skip stored procedures. We'll do that in another video. And I'm going to select tables and views. But I don't want all of the tables in this model. There's uh, some metadata type tables, build version and error log that I don't want and also the sys diagrams table that was created when I used SQL Server Management Studio to create a diagram of my database. On the bottom, um, again, we have a namespace for the model, and it's gotten this long name, so I'm going to shorten that down to match the entities. And I also want to point out, um, because this is new for Visual Studio 2010, these two checkboxes, one is for pluralized or singularized, the names of the objects and also navigation properties that are created in the model and the other is to include foreign keys. Now these are both on by default and um, they are definitely highly recommended to use so I am not going to turn them off. Not just highly recommended by Microsoft but highly recommended by me after using them a lot lately. So now the designer, the wizard, is creating the model based on what it's found in the database from what I selected. So you can see just already, um, here's the customer entity, and it's been created from all of the properties in the customer table. So I'm just going to zoom out a little bit so you can see uh, the bird's eye view of the whole model, which isn't a very big model. There's not a lot of tables here. And then I'll just zoom back in to the customers and a few other entities that we want to take a look at. Over here are some of the views. I'm going to move them out of the way. And the customer, we'll focus for now on the customer and the sales, sales order header entity. So the customer and the sales order header, you can see, have a relationship between them. That relationship is actually defined in the database. There's a constraint there that defines a primary key, foreign key relationship between them. So the wizard picked that up and created a relationship. It's actually called an association between these two entities in the model. And you can even see that this is a one-to-many relationship. So every sales order must have a customer, and every customer can have one or more sales orders, actually a collection of sales orders. And in addition to the properties, you can see there's another section called navigation properties, and that represents the related entities that we might be navigating to. So for customer, we would want to navigate to sales order headers. So this gives us a very easy way to get at sales order headers 
for the customer. And that's something you can take advantage of when you're creating queries so that you don't have to use joins in your queries. And also when you're working with the instantiated objects. So we can have a graph with customer and sales order headers and we can move easily between the two. There's a lot more that's been created in the database. We'll take a look at a few of these things. One of them is, you'll see in the Solution Explorer, attached to the model is a class file. The Entity Framework automatically generates classes for every one of the entities in the model, as well as that entity container we, we talked about before, which was the AW Entities. I gave it that name. So we'll be looking at those in another video. The app config was also added to the project, and I wanted to just show you in the app config we have a new connection string. Now this connection string looks a little different than you might be used to seeing, and that's because it's not simply a database connection string, it's an entity connection string. Actually, if we scroll over to the right, we'll see that contained in the entity connection string is a database connection string. But over here on the left, we have uh, some metadata, and the metadata rep is references pointing to where the important pieces of the model are. So the model that you'll be, you work with when you're querying and working in your application is this model here. This is called the conceptual model. And it's, it's the way we want our model to be. And it's actually something that you can do a lot of customization to. We just won't do it at this time. Um, and this model also has metadata related to it so that Entity Framework knows how to get back and forth between this model, the objects in the model, and your database. The glue between the model and the database are the mapping details. So I'll select customer. We can look at the mapping details of the customer. On the left represents the properties of the customer tables. This is mapped to the customer table. This is a list of all the tables here. And here are all the columns in the customer table. And this mapping shows that each of these columns maps to one of the properties in the entity. I could actually go and change one of the names of the properties in the entity. For example, I'll change company name to company. And you can see over here, I still have my mapping back to the company name, pro company name column in the table. It's not a problem to do this kind of customization. So it doesn't, just as long as the mapping is there, we know how to get back to the right column, to the right table. It doesn't matter what we call these things. I could do all types of customization here. I could delete um, properties not if I don't want to use them, just as long as they're not a non-nullable property, I'd need to be able to deal with that. There will be another video about doing customizations in the entity data model. One of the important things you'll be doing a lot when you're working with your model is referencing this project from other projects. So there are a few important things I want to make sure you're aware of that you need to do any time that you need to use this model in another project. First, of course, from any project, you would be creating a reference to this project. The second thing you'll, you'll need in every project that uses the model is this assembly, the system.data.entity assembly. And that is what contains all of the most important stuff for Entity Framework. There's a number of other assemblies, but this is the critical one for the objects. The other thing that's going to be important to do is the executing application will need this connection string in it. Okay, so the executing application is going to look in its own config file for the, connect, the entity connection string. It's not going to come over to this project to look in its app config file. So those are the three things you need to be sure you do each time. One is reference the assembly. The second is to create the reference to system.data.entity. And the third important thing is to make sure that you get the connection string into the config file for the executing application. So this should be enough to get you started with using your first model. There's much more that you can do with it, such as the customizations I mentioned. And we'll be using this model in many of the videos that I'll be creating for working with the Entity Framework.